somewhere of we have something scheduled that I think may have been scheduled for next week or someone want to just fill me in because I was not here last week and I'm feeling a little bit out. <laughs> and I don't know how I'm supposed to run a meeting if I'm out of the loop, right? That doesn't work. Oh, so. oh no. So this is the, um, the housing first training that we discussed. Okay. See, I knew I was out of the loop. Yeah. All right. So then um, I see a couple unfamiliar names. Uh, Miss Teddy, how long do you think we are going to be going for the training itself? Because I don't want to cut anything short. Okay. You know, I wouldn't, to be honest with you, be surprised if we went 90 minutes. We don't need to go that long. I know Kara and Katie have pre prepared some slides, and I wanted to do a little introduction to abode first. But uh, mainly the goal of today is to allow Lake County in its entirety to ask questions about Housing First specifically. And I know that Justin Ammon told me that he and Pastor Shannon have been doing a lot of deep diving on Housing First. So I think this is our one opportunity to really hear hear about the model and hear about how BOAT is operationalizing the model and get your questions answered and kind of go from there. Then I say, let's go ahead and just jump right in. If it's gonna be, if we've got that much information to cover, then let's okay. do it. Sounds Recording good. in progress. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> Miss Technician. Well, everybody, hey, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I will um, uh, let Kara and Katie introduce abode services in more depth, but I just wanted you all to know, since I'm kind of consulting with Lake County, that really the goal of today was to bring abode services up here from the East Bay, um, Hayward area, Berkeley, and areas like that to describe their services around Housing First. They are, in my estimation, probably one of the premier Housing First models in the United States. So we're lucky that we have folks so close. And um, and I will say too that, you know, I know Kara, Kara will do the introductions and, and talk about Abode, but they've prepared a brief slide set. And then really the goal of today is for you all from Lake County, to understand what Housing First is and also be clear about what Housing First is not. Many of your funded contracts up in Lake County are Housing First specific. And um, you know we need to make sure that we're meeting those mandates coming through the state of California with your funding. So uh, I, I wanted to just thank you for this really wonderful turnout. This will make it worth everybody's time. We are recording just so everybody knows. And um, one other aspect is that I believe Jillian uh, from Home Base will be joining in just for a listen in to get going. So without further hesitation, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you, Kara. And, and I just, and again, my deepest appreciation for you and Katie being able to make this time to help us out today. Um, we're glad to be here. Do I have ability to screen share? Let's see. Yes, you do. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes. We can. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Hi, I'm Kara Carnahan, uh, Vice President of Programs at Abode Services. I currently see all of our housing and services operations in Alameda County, San Francisco, and Napa counties. I've been at Abode for 16 years, and I've been working with unhoused populations for about, whoops, going too fast, for about uh, over 20 years now. Um, I'm very passionate about Housing First, harm reduction, and just creating programs that are low barrier and target our most vulnerable people. I've worked in programs. I've worked with seriously mentally ill, chronically homeless. I've done outreach. I've worked on the housing side. I've done a little bit of everything. So I am an administrator now, but I do have a lot of direct practice um, experience. And I know what it's like to be on the ground, running programs on the ground, providing services to tough populations. And I'll pass it to my colleague, Katie. Hey there, I'm Katie Fanton. I'm the Senior Director of Housing Programs for Santa Clara and Santa Cruz Counties. I've also uh, been in that director role in Alameda and San Mateo Counties. So I have a decent amount of experience um, in the housing world. I've been at Abode six years this year, this week actually, um, which feels like 12 um, in the last couple of years, especially. Um, and my experience is at Housing First is, it makes the most sense to me of, of any sort of evidence-based practice model that I've seen in my career. Um, it, in my experience, especially with 
uh, providing housing services to folks who essentially just need an opportunity to stabilize in housing. It's, it's an incredibly helpful model, um, though it ha it's hard. It is not, it's a day-to-day -day, um, reevaluation and processing and really trying to make the model work for the participant or the, or the family involved versus trying to do it the other way around. Um, so I'm excited to talk about some of the ways that um, our teams have been able to make it successful, even in really high cost communities and or communities that have really struggled with the transition to Housing First. So I supervise direct staff um, and direct managers who work on the ground with participants. Um, so I'm looking forward to talking to you all more. Thanks, Katie. So I thought I would just start a little bit with who we are as Abode. Um, so Abode's mission is to end homelessness by assisting low-income, unhoused people, including those with special needs, to secure stable, supportive housing and to be advocates for the removal of the cause of homelessness. We are a homeless and housing agency through and through, uh, I think, which can be very different than a lot of other agencies. There's other agencies that are, you know, mostly mental health agencies and do a little bit of housing. Everything that we do is in service of um, unstably housed or unhoused people and how do we help to further stabilize their housing and or end their homelessness. So that's what we do with, with every program that we run. Uh, this is our reach for fiscal year 2021. So you can see that we are in six counties, um, Alameda and Santa Clara counties being our largest counties that we serve, San Mateo, uh, Napa, Santa Cruz, and San Francisco being the other counties that we're in. Um, you'll see that our numbers in uh, San Francisco and Santa Cruz are much smaller than some of the other counties that we provide services in. And that's because we just started in those counties uh, really within the last uh, 12 to 18 months. So we're just getting started there, but expect big things from us there. Um, and we're always looking to expand our reach in the Bay Area for sure. Um, you can kind of think of a boat as having three arms. We have our housing development arm, our property management arm and our housing and services arm. Our housing development arm, we have a team of folks that are actually looking to create, build, rehab more housing for unhoused individuals. Um, there just isn't enough of it. Um, and so really their focus on how, is how to create more permanent supportive housing units that are available in the communities that we're in. We have our property management arm and those folks really provide specialized property management services to uh, people and permanent supportive housing sites. We understand that um, working with folks that have long histories of homelessness, uh, you know, uh, doing property management for those properties are a little bit different. I mean, there are, we're always following housing law, but how we work with those tenants is different than how we would work in te with tenants in maybe, uh, you know, regular apartment buildings where there aren't um, such a focus on um, housing unhoused people. And then we have our housing and our services arm, and that's really where Katie and I sit. We're on that side of the house. And um, for our services, we do everything from front door services. So we have outreach team street health team, street medicine team, um, shelters. We have several shel shelters. We do short-term, long-term case management. Um, we employ psychiatrists, licensed clinicians, peers, case managers. Um, and we really, this, this is the group of folks on the services side that are really to provide, providing those in permanent supportive housing, providing those supportive services. And then on the housing side, those are really the folks that are, real, are, look, are working to locate housing, building relationships with landlords, really working with the property, working with the landlord in service of um, keeping that tenant um, stably housed and placed in their house. And so both very important roles. And when they work harmoniously together, we get the best results with people that we're serving. Okay, so why Housing First? Um, you know, traditionally, uh, before Housing First, uh, homeless services were kind of on a continuum. 
if you go to shelter and you're successful, you might get moved to transitional housing. And if they're, then you're there for a couple of years and you kind of, you know, prove that you're worthy and you can handle it, then we might think about giving you a permanent place to live. Um, permanent housing was kind of an reward for people that could navigate the system and could kind of get it together. Permanent housing seeks or uh, housing first seeks to move people from the streets directly into housing as quickly as possible. Really recognizing that, um, really recognizing that it is difficult for folks to work on things like medication adherence, you know, reducing their substance use or thinking about a recovery plan getting their kids um, into school and making sure that their kids are attending school on a regular basis, attending medical appointments. So Housing First really seeks to um, really look at housing as one of the foundational uh, components of people moving forward in their lives. And so really, you know, we, our goal at Abode is really when we find somebody that is homeless, whether they're first time homeless or they've been chronically homeless for 20 plus years, how can we have the straightest path to stable housing and getting them housed as quickly as possible? Um, I think, uh, you know, old models assume that active drug users or people that have, were in mental health crisis or maybe not uh, seeing their therapist or psychiatrist regularly, they were not folks that could succeed in housing. And so why put them into housing? Let's make it hard for them to get into housing. Um, and the old methods really were successful in working with households and families and individuals that really had low barriers to housing. Um, they didn't have a lot of sort of uh, background stuff that would make them make it difficult for them to access housing. It really was not an approach that uh, was really good at reaching the hardest to serve, reaching the most vulnerable people in our community and successfully helping those people remain safe and housed. Um, those with the most barriers often remain homeless and in crisis. And so there was sort of this catch 22 that was created like you're not well enough to be in housing, you're not stable enough to be in housing, but your life wasn't organized and stable enough to work on the things that were speed destabilizing your, your life. Um, there was always ongoing trauma that people were experiencing that was maybe exacerbating sort of the mental health that they were experiencing or the substance use. And it was really hard to get a handle on that because what helps people feel safe is having a safe place to live. Um, and people were really screened out of programs um, based on eviction histories, criminal history, lack of income. Um, and, you know, without being in housing, it was really hard to work on cleaning up your eviction record or cleaning up your credit or really following through and increasing your income so that you had the resources to be able to get into housing. Um, faced with a Faced with a growing number of very vulnerable people on the streets, not engaged in services, providers looked for answers. Um, and when you talk to people, when you ask them what they need, what they want, they will most often say, I want housing. Um, and it's really about housing choice. Um, and so, you know, there was this sort of revolution, let's, let's give people housing. What happens if we were just to give people housing? And what we find is that people want it. People work to keep it um, with the right um, settings and with the right supports, people are able to. Um, I can't, you know, I always get asked this question of like, oh, well, how do you know if someone's going to be successful in housing? I can't predict who's going to be successful in housing. Um, and what we see in our programs and what the data shows is that housing retention rates are well over 90% um, and people engage in services when they have a supportive trusting person that's working with them. Um, in their housing. So I'll pass it to Katie. Awesome. So what it, what exactly is housing first? It, this is going to sound a little redundant, but it means housing before anything else. Ultimately, um, it's a, it's a housing-based methodology providing assistance immediately to folks who are experiencing homelessness. It's the belief essentially that uh, housing, when housing is provided, 
it is the most likely way for folks to make decisions that help their own health, um, wellness, and self-sufficiency. Uh, we don't, Housing First does not require any kind of uh, adherence to a particular plan that isn't part of the plan that the participant themselves have created. Um, but the intervention consists of permanent housing, supportive services, and it's essential for the foundation of their recovery. Services, when we say sort of, um, uh, supportive services are not mandatory and sobriety is not required, but Housing First is a uh, focus on securing housing and maintaining housing once a lease is negotiated. Um, it's just, again, based on the participants' priorities, not our providers' expectations. Let me click on the next slide. Here we go. Uh, some of the key principles of Housing First. Anyone can succeed in housing if given sufficient support. Any participants should have the rights and responsibilities of tenants. So this is really the key of focusing on lease adherence versus adherence to any kind of uh, process that's, that's, sorry, I just totally lost the slides. Um, any kind of uh, navigation of, uh, sorry, give me two seconds. Kara, can you finish the sentence for a second? Because my internet just did something weird. Um, oh, our internet here. Um, so where Katie was going with this is Housing First really focuses on adherence to, when people are in housing, it's adherence to their lease. So how are they following the rules of the lease? So that they're not uh, in a position where a property manager or a landlord could, um, you know, begin sort of lease violations with them. It's not, are you clean and sober? Are you meeting with your case manager? But really, are you paying your rent? Are you being a good neighbor? Are you following the terms of your lease? That's really what we focus on in Housing First. Yep, thanks, Kara. I'm back now. This also is predicated on the idea that many people in the world are in leases who might even engage in behavior that we're not so sure would be ideal for us but they are still housed and they're successfully housed. And I think we sort of level, with Housing First, we really level the playing field to say, housing should not be predicated on behavior, but housing is predicated on adherence to a lease and a reasonable lease, a lease that's appropriate. And within the, you know, obviously, as we work with landlords within a community, we also wanna ensure that there's housing stability for the sake of the landlord. And so making sure that we are engaging with participants in their units, and having conversations about what it looks like to be a tenant that is going to be able to live in their unit in the long term. So it's not necessarily a setting standards and we're sort of being redundant, but I think it's important to keep saying it is that the standard really is housing helps people stabilize, secure house, housing helps people think through what they want their future to be like and focusing on housing related principles versus hoops that folks may feel like they have to jump through in order to, to keep and keep housing is, is what we want to move away from. The other piece about the principle is that it, so we would do whatever it takes to house and engage participants. We are willing to meet participants where they're at. We're willing to go out into encampments and to, uh, into shelters as they are engaged and enrolled in programs, have honest reality-based conversations about housing and be really open to finding housing options that are the most realistic to help them succeed. That doesn't necessarily mean that every participant is in their dream home for the rest of their lives, is their next step in their housing journey. So as we sit and we talk to participants about what kind of housing they're looking for, um, we often get all kinds of answers, right? As many of us, if we if someone sat down with me and said, hey, what's your ideal housing situation? I, you know, I like where I live now, but I might actually say some other things. And I'd have to have some reality-based conversations with myself about like what I can actually, you know, do and afford, right? So we, but we have really honest conversations. One of the other principles is the first housing option and the first housing placement may not be the one that works and it may not be the only one. And acknowledging that it can take a really long time for housing stability to happen and, per and providers, we wanna be patient and supportive and really helping uh, not necessarily um, assume that if someone places out of housing the first time that they haven't been successful, but continuing to build trust and engage uh, for the future. 
housing first oh. is different. Oh, sorry, Kara, is this one you? Thank you, I'm sorry. No, it's all good. Um, housing first is different from the continuum model in that people are screened in, not screened out, uh, that we're really looking for opportunities to provide housing for folks, regardless of what they've done, where they've been, where they're going. Uh, there's no drug testing, sobriety is not a prerequisite. We use a harm reduction approach, um, which Caro, I think we'll talk a little bit more about in a, in a couple minutes. Uh, service participation is not a requirement. I know that uh, that we can talk about that in the Q&A. I know that can feel like a stressful um, dynamic, but as we make services more supportive, participants want to participate in them. So it's sort of, it doesn't say you have to do this because we just want to meet with you. It says, we want to make this as helpful to you as possible, which motivates you to want to meet with us. Housing is central to the intervention, not a reward for progress. Um, as I mentioned before, people get multiple chances and eviction and termination is absolutely a last resort. Uh, we have lots of creative ways to move away from that. We don't necessarily want to leave folks more in harm than they were when they started. So we have some creative ways of working with owners and being really transparent and being really honest to help um, assume that we never want folks to, to end up in an eviction scenario. We, um, as an agency, use a harm reduction approach. Um, we do not require anybody that we work with in any setting that we work with, even our shelters, to be sober. It's really about uh, talking with folks about where they are in the stages of change um, and working with them where they're at on the goals that they're willing to work on. And sometimes, you know, it's helping people to use in a way because they're very clear with us that they're not ready to make any behavioral changes. Um, around substance use, it could be other, other, you know, other behaviors that might cause, you know, problems in their life. Um, but we were, sometimes the intervention is acknowledging that you're not ready to be in a recovery program. Um, and how do we help you in housing use in a way that does not violate your needs, that does not make you disruptive to the community, that does not put you on the radar of property management because that's where you're at right now. Um, and it's not that we stay there, it's continual conversations with folks and use of, use of motivational interviewing and capitalizing on those opportunities to move people forward in their recovery when they're ready for it. But a lot of times when we first meet with people, when we first work with people, you know, they're, the first thing they'll say, I'm not gonna stop smoking crack. Okay. Okay, that's where we're at today. Let's work around that to keep your housing and really um, um, partnering with folks where they're really at. Awesome. And you may be thinking, yeah, you all are saying some great words. How do you actually do this? Mm -hmm. um, and I will tell you, as someone who's been doing this a while, I sometimes wonder the same thing because it's really hard. <laughs> it's great in practice, great in principle, but can be really hard in practice. Uh, we don't screen people out for behaviors like, or issues like lack of income or lack of employment, poor credit history, eviction history. What Kara said earlier is so incredibly true though, is we v never can predict who is going to do well in housing and who isn't because people are people they're variable right they're not necessarily uh, at their first meeting with us they're not necessarily uh, able to articulate all of the hopes and dreams that they have for themselves and we are not able to articulate what we think is going to happen for them at the end of their journey so we're really committed to being present with folks all along the way at the same time there's a there's a a whole other entity in which we have to engage and that is landlords and property managers right Landlords and property managers are pretty interested in having tenants that are going to be successful in their units. They're interested in ensuring that their units, the units that they've, many of them have saved for, for forever to uh, be able to purchase. So we have to have a lot of reality-based conversations with market rate landlords and really providing coaching and support, really practical conversations around like, gosh, we understand that when your tenant is, you know, for example, your tenant's banging on the door at two o'clock in the morning and your other tenants are really mad about that. That is a really legitimate thing for us to talk about. It's a legitimate thing for you to talk about with your tenant and for us to talk about with our program participant and to say, hey, we understand that you may want to bang on the door at two in the morning, but that has consequences and we'd be really bummed if you lost your lease. So let's talk about what you can do at two in the morning instead. 
Um, there could be other options. If you're feeling anxious, let's talk about your anxiety. Uh, but really being able to have transparent conversations with landlords and property managers, frankly, without talking about issues that landlords and property managers don't have to know about. I think sometimes people assume um, because our program participants are in a program that all of a sudden their private life is open for discussion with landlords and property managers. That's not a thing. We don't have to tell a landlord anything more than I have told landlords in my own life. We can talk about things like employment, we can talk about income, we can talk about things like tenancy, but it's not appropriate for landlords and property managers to ask questions about medical issues because they don't ask about any of us, any of our medical issues, right? So it, it's, but it's important to come to that perspective with kindness and compassion and partnership, acknowledging that landlords and property managers are our clients as much as our clients are our clients and acknowledging that they have separate needs and separate requirements from our program participants. And it's, it takes a lot of work. Um, I, I don't know if we talked about this much in the slides, but I'll mention it. Abode has a real value on sort of splitting up positions in terms of housing in particular to say that there's services teams that are working specifically with participants on their uh, plans and their stability plans. And we have what we call housing specialists that are working specifically with landlords and property managers, folks who have experience in property management, folks who have experience in sales, folks who have experience with housing work that can speak the language of a landlord or a property manager to kind of um, sort of be mediators um, for our participants as well as for our landlords. Because we acknowledge without landlords and property managers, we have nothing. Let's see, we talked about this a little bit. I think we've actually talked quite a bit about this, but essentially um, people get multiple chances. Uh, we know that one housing situation in one community may not work for a participant, but maybe another housing opportunity in another community is gonna work for them. So really being person-centered um, versus being program-centered. In terms of eviction and termination, um, it's really the last resort and only when there are serious unresolved